It's time once again to slip into your camo, grab your bow, and join us out in the field for another episode of the Up North Journal, presented by PSE Archery. The Up North Journal crew is knocked and ready to rock for another exciting adventure. So let's step outside and hit the trail. This episode of the Up North Journal podcast is brought to you by PSE Archery, Black Eagle Arrows, Scent Blocker, Killer Food Plots, Cabela's, Spot Shooters, Antler Action, Family Traditions Tree Stands, Tom's Custom Turkey Calls, and Badass Slingshots. Welcome back, everybody. Another episode of the Up North Journal. I'm your host, Mike Adams, sitting in the cabin tonight with a little warm weather with Danny Defaw. A little warm weather. Mid-60s. Mid yeah. February. I know. it. What's up with that? Man, what a, what a warm weekend. This has been a crazy week. Uh, huh. week, week to come, actually. Uh, I survived the week. What are you talking about? Mi- yeah, you are on death's door. Man. <laughs> I started going downhill after last week's show. and You went downhill quick. I, I hit rock bottom by Wednesday, and I was out of work all week. I am so glad that whatever you had, you didn't leave here in the cabin. I, I cried uncle and actually went to the doctor. Yeah? That's that's pretty big for me. Well. I, by Wednesday night, I said, okay, I had enough of this. Had enough. But uh, I, I, had the, I had the flu, officially. Okay. Influenza B. Well, I'm glad you're back with us. Yeah, it, you know, whew, glad man, everything's that was good. tough. But uh, but then you passed it on to your lovely wife, and now she's suffering. You're right, Kevin. It's bow fishing weather. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, uh, man, strange week. Now the last two days, it's been sixty degrees out. No, no snow whatsoever. I know it. It's it's, it's wild to think that we're. What's the date today? The eighteenth, nineteenth, nineteenth. It's the nineteenth of February. We still have officially what uh, nine more days to go. In February. In February. And over a week, and uh, it, it was in the mid-60s here. Um, there's no snow on the ground. Exactly. And it's supposed to be this warm all week. Mm-hmm. So the next week, we're going to have this warm. So 50 you degree can weather. kiss the ice goodbye. There is no, yeah, there's no ice. Um, actually, yesterday, I heard some kids here locally put a quad on the ice and went through. Um, don't know any of the story. Don't know if they made it out. Don't know none of that. But uh, pretty crazy, so. But, uh, yeah, anybody that's out there that's on our uh, Facebook page right now watching the live stream, make sure if there's anything you want to uh, chime in with, feel free to. Uh, Danny's monitoring the live feed here, so, you know, we'll try to answer some stuff yeah. as we go along. So. You know, and matter of fact, I think it was Friday. Friday? It must have been Friday. Yeah. They had two separate incidents of teenagers. One was walking a dog out on the ice. Uh-huh. And the other one was, I think they were just out on the ice. Right. But they had to go and get, get saved. So... Well, you know. here, here's just a little bit of uh, advice. Stay off the ice. There is no ice. Yeah, exactly. Well, all right, I'm getting texts from my wife about the dogs barking. So if you guys hear a dog barking in the background, it's it's my dog. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, so we went to the show this weekend. We did. What, what did you think overall? Uh, deer and turkey. Sh- a deer in the field and stream. Deer and turkey spectacular 2017. Um, I was a little surprised. Good or bad surprise or indifferent? Uh, I thought the show was going to be... The show was good. Could it have been better? Yes. I was surprised at actually it being smaller than it was the previous year. Mm-hmm. Had a few less vendors. Yes. Uh, you could tell. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had some great vendors. But, uh, yeah, it was uh, It was just interesting dynamic. And uh, the foot traffic that we had coming through wasn't... I don't know. I guess this show over the years is just going down. Either that or what I'm hoping was the weather had a lot to do with it. <laughs> you you going to make it there, bud? Yeah, I'm going to make it. Okay. But uh, the weather, I think the weather had a lot to do with it, you know, as far as people getting out. They were outside. They they didn't want to go inside to a show. You know, they're going to enjoy a week a weekend of 60-degree uh, weather in Michigan in February. And speaking of 60-degree weather, Jason Radecki mm-hmm. uh, was playing in a bowling tournament up in Houghton Lake. And there are still vehicles out on the ice in Houghton Lake. Okay. Well, Houghton Lake gets pretty thick pretty so quick. You know, it's you know it's above 24 inches of ice. Right, right. That lake tends to thicken up pretty quick and stay thick. Oh, and, and Jason, do you also like the, the, the you've seen the killer food plots? Mm-hmm. Nice. What? We got more to say here about that here in just a few minutes. Right. So, but, uh, no, I was, you know, I this used to be one of the premier shows for, for the show season. For Michigan, mid-Michigan. For Michigan. Yeah. yeah. Like we talked about, there used to be three shows, one on each side of the state and in mm-hmm. the middle. Right. This was the in the middle that was supposed to be the show. Uh, the west side one is the Hunt and Time Expo. Yep. Then you got the mid one, which is this one. And then in September, you have 
the East Side show, Woods and Water. Right. But this show was just a. It was. I don't know. It's hard to say. Put the finger on it. Why? I heard a bunch of different reasons. Yeah, everybody has a theory. Right. Exactly. You know, um, uh, warm weather. Uh, it was a bad weekend because of the NWTF uh, going mm. on. But that. I, that's a Nashville. I don't I, think that had a lot to do with it. I don't think so either. The, the more you look at the overall, you look at it. Um, it's just uh, I don't know. It's going downhill. But maybe not. Maybe they'll do something to. to it, it was it was complained when the venue left downtown. Yeah, when it went out of town, and they all complained. And it came but, back, but it was packed when yeah. it was out of town. Yeah. Now that it came back, and, nobody came back. Yeah, I don't understand what the issue is what, what's causing it talking to jerry lambert today he said on saturday mornings they used to get there at, at, at nine o'clock in the morning and they, they'd get tired of being shoulder to shoulder but there was so many people there. i remember that i remember those days right and now he goes look do you think the do you think shows in general are changing i mean we we talked to a few people who were at harrisburg and they said it's a great show they had a great time there uh, a little bit long being nine days but they had a genuinely good time there and got to meet people who they needed to meet. Uh, you know what? Um, or do you think shows are starting to change? you think people are getting tired I, I, of the shows, I maybe? It could be that because, really, truthfully, from the second week of January, you could play show a week mm-hmm. and just bounce around the entire area. Well, last weekend you were... I was in Birch Run. Run. Yeah, at the everybody Hunt, Hunt want, Expo. It, it, it's almost like everybody wants a piece of that pie mm-hmm. for their venue. Right. So they try to, to make a show, but all it does is, is, is slice up the pie more yeah. and more. Yeah, only so many people are going to go to a hunting show. Right, exactly. And, uh, you know, but you talk to some people, that last week's show they did really good at. Mm-hmm. So um, the Harrisburg show, I think, is unique. I think that's just unique in size. It covers two weekends, nine days long. Nine days long, two weekends, and everything's segmented, right? Mm-hmm. If you want to go... Guns, and ammos, and rifles over here. Archery over here. Outfitters, um, kind of like the Hunting Time Expo. Uh, the one main area is, is outfitters. Then you got the vendors off in the back, and mm-hmm. I think that was still a pretty. Uh, I'll have to talk to Dave to get his overall opinion of the whole weekend. I just seen him there the one day, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, it's kind of hard to say. It, it, well, then we got the things coming up at Cabela's. We got the shows that are coming. To, I mean, not they're not traditionally shows they're more like events they're, yeah the events okay. at cabela's well, then we got our you know the turkey seminars are coming up for our local chapter in wtf you got the sci show and banquet coming up then you got all these other banquets are coming this time of year i mean there is a lot to do with outdoor gatherings and i'm just wondering maybe is it getting to a point where maybe we've just got too many it could be absolutely absolutely whatever you know you know why not like I said, everybody wants to have their show mm-hmm. at their venue, right? But it, in reality, when you could only have, if you could have three or three shows, one on the west side, one in the middle, and one on the east, right? And it build up for that big show. But then, right. if it's not at your venue, you're going to say, "Well, I want a piece of that." Right? Absolutely. So, you know, it's just one of those things. I, I wish there would have been a lot more people. We had a great time. Got to see a lot of great people there, yeah, you know, yeah, working you know. the PSC booth. The thing I noticed this weekend, especially with, uh, with there at the shooting booth, was the the people coming in to shoot bows seem to start <laughs> trending more. You okay there? Yeah, man. Oh, okay, just checking on you, making sure you're all right. Um, we're trending towards females and younger females. It was most, you know, I'd say between women and men, it was probably 60% men, 40% women. And and probably a third of the women that were there were young, you know, teenage girls. So well, that, and that, I think we're seeing a trend, and that's a good thing because we we talked about this. Uh, matter of fact, uh, talking with the QDMA gentleman, mm-hmm. gentleman this week about about the the hundred numbers going down, right? So that's a good trend to see in the archery. Uh, but there's a lot of target archer lady archers out there though too. That's true. And seeing more and more, it's because they can, everybody can do it, right? Which is kind of nice. And you know what? It depends on how how much money you want to spend in it. You can go little or a lot. But I think it's good to see that. Uh, just getting people out in general. It's just seeing the younger crowd out there as well. Absolutely, it's good so. to see. Hopefully, it'll uh, we'll start to see things turn around the other way. So, yep. Are you sure you're okay? I'm all right. Okay, all right. So Dan's going to have the sniffles and coughs for this show. Yes, I am. So we'll just have to have to tolerate that. You will. 
Um, but uh, you know what? Uh, we're, we're bumping up here close to our first break. Um, we're going to do something a little different here, especially for the live stream people. Uh, we're we're going to throw it to a break here. But before we do, um, the next segment is actually going to be with Nick Percy of Killer Food Plots. And we talk with Nick at the show this week, and we're going to talk frost seeding. So for those of you on the live stream that want to listen to this part, you're actually going to have to tune into the podcast because uh, it, it was pre-recorded and we don't have the ability to actually play that for you here tonight. So right uh, for those we of you did yeah you know, we we did, but it's not working tonight. So for those of you listening on the regular podcast right now, we're going to take a quick break. We come back. You're going to hear Nick Percy talking about frost seeding those food plots, getting ready for this spring. We'll be right back after this. PSE Archery has always dominated the speed category. Now. The most revolutionary cam system ever to hit the market has perfected the shooting experience. Introducing PSE's Evolve Cam System, featuring extremely high let-off capabilities and the smoothest draw cycle in history. No other cam system has ever delivered this level of total comfort and total control. Experience PSE. Experience performance. Throughout human history, one notorious killer has remained at the top and claimed more lives than any war or natural disaster combined. Mosquitoes. It's time to arm yourself and protect your family this season with Scent Blocker's new Bug Blocker for insects. Lasting up to eight hours, Bug Blocker not only repels biting mosquitoes that can carry the West Nile virus, but other biting insects, including chiggers, biting flies, gnats, and ticks which can carry Lyme disease. Field tested by outfitters and guides from Alaska to Alabama and everywhere in between. The results are in, and Bug Blocker flat out works. In a high-potency sportsman strength dosage, using 25% no-nonsense DEET, plus two specific ingredients to target biting flies, Bug Blocker plays for keeps. For ultimate protection, pair Bug Blocker insects with Bug Blocker ticks. Welcome, everybody, back to another segment up North Journal, and we're coming to you live from the 2017 Deer and Turkey Spectacular here in Lansing, Michigan. And we are here live in the Killer Food Plots booth with none other than Nick Percy. Hey, Nick, how's it going? Great. How are you guys doing? We're doing fantastic. Excellent. You know, we're, uh, we're here in February, and we talked uh, before a little bit, but uh, we're starting to think about food plots. But what should we, what should we start to think about now? Uh, well, we are approaching, we've got a little bit of a, a warm-up here, which is getting, getting us thinking frost seeding. Absolutely. This frost seeding will be usually in April, late April, mid to late April, depending on how Mother Nature is cooperating. Hopefully this isn't the uh, drought of four years ago that no, we're about no. ready to encroach on. But, uh, I think this is just a little taste. <laughs> getting a little warm-up to spring, but yeah, usually mid to late April. You're going to want to get out there and get your stuff frost seeded. Okay, uh, so, okay so frost seeding. Take us through it. So frost seeding uh, is the spreading of clovers, chicories, alfalfas. Those are the three varieties that that we offer where you can frost seed those ahead of the complete thaw or completion of a little bit of snow, rain uh, aspect. Okay. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to get the seed out there during that fluctuation in the in the weather patterns. And you're allowing Mother Nature between rain, some snowfall, some up and down heaving of the frost coming out of the ground to essentially establish that perennial food plot early ahead of the grass and the weeds. You're letting Mother Nature do the work for you. Exactly. You know, and that's one of the things um, that, you know, you do a lot of work here, but there's some things you can do and let Mother Nature do it. And frost seeding is one of them. Yep, it is. Now, what you want to do is you want to try to do frost seeding we generally suggest that you do that in areas that you've previously planted, maybe with a late season uh, brassica blend, like our carnage brassicas or our deep woods. Those big leafy greens tend to cover the ground. You don't have a lot of uh, weed and grass infiltration in the late part of the fall, and your food plot is clean, like a clean slate to start your frost seeding. If you don't have that situation, you can still go ahead and frost seed into those areas this is great for folks that don't have equipment or they have the right, right equipment to turn. It's a really good option to try to beat the grass and weeds. And then with a little simple sprayer, 
they can go ahead and address the grass and weeds in the plot a little bit later. Oh, okay. So this is this is basically uh, blank slating it for the new year. Yes, exactly. And you, by frost seeding it, like you said, you're letting Mother Nature use them. Uh, we do this in the next couple of weeks because we know what's going to happen in April. And now, is there anything else we should look forward to? Or uh, speaking of that, you mentioned. Uh, getting your soil tested oh yes absolutely it's very important okay so do you offer that or local extension service or because let's say here I am I just bought a new acreage and what, what that's that should be my first step right yeah soil test soil testing is the most important step because a soil test is think about it as your blueprint for your seed bed of your food plot and that will tell you exactly where your soil is at at that point and then what we can do with that soil test uh, we do offer soil testing to answer okay. your question it's twenty dollars per per food plot location or per soil submission and then what we do is we will uh, make all the right recommendations based on the forage that you're going to put the seed that you want to plant there We'll be able to tell you how much lime you need, how much potash, how much magnesium, whatever is deficient in the food plot, we can tell you what to add. And normally it's not a lot of, it's not terribly expensive to fix your soil. It's terribly expensive when you don't soil test and you fail. Right, or exactly. Get, or you get a lot less forage. There, there's <laughs> nothing worse than going out, spending a whole bunch of money, and all of a sudden you get nothing but fail. Yes, exactly. And, you know, and, and a lot of people do that. They think, man, it's 20 bucks skip you know skip one case of beer and buy a soil test and you'll be a lot happier shooting a bigger deer later in the year for your 20 bucks uh than than uh than just winging it and hoping for the best you are not kidding so so basically people what we're trying to say is, is, is now is the time that you can use mother nature on your side to do a little frost seeding uh make sure though first and foremost get soil tested how you get that soil nick will help you out uh, just go to KillerFoodPlots.com. Yep, then go KillerFoodPlots.com, or they can email me at Nick at KillerFoodPlots.com, either way, and they can ask questions. They can go on Facebook or Instagram, so they can message us through uh, Facebook, ask questions there. And there's some really good resources on Facebook as far as previous customers, their successes, what works for them. Uh, we, you know, come on over, join the KFP family, and we'll help you get some success. There you go. And along with the, the website, uh, you're going to have YouTube videos out there uh, down the road here to help people that they can click on in and check it out and how to yeah, do it? Yeah, we'll probably post them and link them into our uh, YouTube webpage, but they'll also be on our Facebook or on our actual new website. We're going to try to get those videos entered right in there. When you click on the product, we're going to embed those videos into the new website. Hopefully, that'll be out here in the next few weeks. We're okay. a little behind the eight ball on it, but we're getting her done. So. Yeah, that's right. So stay tuned for more from Killer Food Plots in their new website. But... You know, we, we talked about seeds and everything, but that's not the newest thing here at Killer Food Plots. No, we've got some great new products. You've got this 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 product here that comes in a canister. Yep, this is this new product is called Suffuse. We've been uh, experimenting and getting it refined for about the last three years. Uh, we're we're uh, very proud of a couple different factors with this product. A it, the dispersion of this product with the sprayer that we have. We're so used to that little tiny sprayer where we get our finger and we're like, eat, 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 and it kind of squirts out a little bit at us. This sprayer that we have is able to um, atomize the, the uh, cover scent attractant that's in it into a fine mist and it continually sprays for two and a half seconds each time you pull the trigger. You can right. stop it immediately by releasing, but um, it also has a bladder inside of the bottle so that it doesn't freeze when you're out there in the woods. How many times has your cover scent attractant frozen? And you can see that if you look through the bottom of the bottle, you can see the, the, the rubber bladder in there. Yep. And you know what, people? Uh, if you take a look at this on the website and you, you see it, uh, they uh, it's not your typical looking bottle, the squirt bottle. Right. Uh, the It's a one pump deal and uh, it, it, it comes in several different attractions. Yeah, several different um, scents. It, we have, for just our attractants for whitetail, we have our RIP, uh, which is our fresh bedding. That can be used all season long. We spray that in like uh, areas where we have licking branches, where we know we have bedding or we create bedding areas. We use it as an attractant to kind of create a trail. Um, this is part of our RAD system, which creates a reaction, an attraction, and then the D for distraction. So you get, your, you get this scent into the deer's nose. The, the product is called Suffuse. Okay, S-U-F-F-U-Z-E. 
Now, uh, suffuse, what that means is it means a liquid that takes over or overwhelms, and that's exactly what it does. It's a natural base, food grade scent. So our sweet corn literally smells like you cracked open a, a can of, of sweet of, corn, of sweet of corn. actual cream corn. Our Red Hot 24 is uh, another one of our attractants. That attractant it has hot dopey in it, and all of our products uh, um, as a whole, we're giving 20% more product than the average cover center attractant. Normally they're in eight ounce bottles, we give 10. We have the bladder, we have the better dispersion. This product lasts a lot longer, it doesn't freeze up, it doesn't cause issues, and the sprayer is also refillable. We're gonna have refillable um, uh, canisters. And for those people who travel and they fly to their different destinations oh, yeah. to hunt, we're looking at, right now we don't have it, but we're working towards finding concentrated bottles where you can take an empty sprayer, you can bring the concentration and we'll have the mixing ratio. Once you get to your destination, you dump it in the bottle, add the right amount of water, fill it up, shake it up, you're ready to go wherever it is you're hunting. And, and I tell you what, that that is that is invaluable because how many times oh i want to take this with me but you can't take liquids on the plane right right yep exactly so you don't have to leave your you know added benefits and it's not baiting it's none of those things that you know go against some of those areas where we can't uh we can't bait or we can't do food plot or whatever you know or, or feed pellets or whatever the liquid is a good solution for that and you just don't have this for deer either no we also have two cents for bear we have our muscadine grape and we have our blueberry, and those two are, are excellent. Again, there's several states where you can bear hunt, but you're not allowed to bait, and that is a, is a very, very strong, concentrated blueberry smell, as well as uh, the muscadine grape, and they're food grade, so you can spray them on any type of vegetation, and the, the bears are drawn to them. Same thing with the white tail, with the sweet corn, the um, white oak acorn, the persimmon, the red apple. All of those are food grade. You start up spraying it up high, drop it down low, bring it out in front of your, where your kill shot is and concentrate a spot on the ground, and that's where the deer go. They start up, they smell it coming downwind of you. It's a good cover scent. It's water-based, so you can spray it on your hunting clothes when you're in your tree. It's swirling, so when your scent is swirling, it will swirl that smell. As soon as they get that in their nose, it's all they can smell it. It, it overloads over, them. It overwhelms their sensory, their sense of smell, and that's what they, that's uh, that's the benefit to you, the hunter. So that is awesome. That's just another thing coming here from Killer Food Plots. Well, Nick, uh, I want to thank you for your time, and uh, you know we're going to check back with you for some summertime tips yep. uh, as we go forward. But we just wanted to hit you up for uh, the beginning of the year to see yep. what we can do. Well, also you guys check out our core infusion, high protein uh, bodybuilding feed as well. It's full vitamin, chelated mineral. All the natural ingredients, the core ingredients, C-O-R-E, infusion. And that's another one of our brand new products we just launched at ATA. We're excited. I've been using it at High Fence for years. I've been selling to my guys. I now found a source where I can produce it for a buck a pound retail. Um, and, and you mix it with corn, mix it with soybeans at different years. I'm not at different times of the year to get your fat and your protein levels to where you need them. So check that out on the website as well. We're excited. We can't wait to get uh, more of our customers uh, benefiting from that. Exactly. So that's right, folks. Uh, check out Killer Food Plots, uh, killerfoodplots.com, or simply just go to Facebook. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, I appreciate it, guys. Thanks a lot, man. So what do you do when you've completely redefined the way bows are engineered? When you've reached the pinnacle and the band starts playing your victory song, you start a revolution out of thin air. Introducing the all-new PSE Carbon Air, engineered with true carbon technology to be the lightest high-performance bow in the world. Experience PSE. Experience performance. We know the future of hunting depends on our nation's youth. But did you know that in many states, it's illegal for you to take your son or daughter hunting until the age of 12 or even older? As a result, we have fewer young hunters, and the Families of Field program is designed to eliminate those barriers. Hunting is safe, and the safest hunters of field are young people with adult mentors. Visit our website at familiesoffield.org to find out how you can bring more families afield. Welcome back, everybody. Third segment of the show. Got done talking isn't with it, Nick Percy. Isn't it nice to use Mother Nature as uh, your own personal uh, 
help to plant seed sower. <laughs> right, right on. You know, and it, it's just one of those things. Uh, it, and you think about it, it makes perfect sense, right? I think so. Use everything you can to your advantage. Right, and some people, you know, you, all you gotta do is go out there and, and and spread the seed on top of the soil and let the let nature heat, take over. Heat and cold contractions of the day just let that seed work in well the thing with uh, talking with nick uh, actually we're, we're, we're going to work on a couple things with nick here this year hopefully and get things uh laid down on video we're going to start shooting some video on some some things we're doing it uh on on my personal food plot up north so uh as that progresses throughout the year we're going to be showing some different things it's, uh, right and so it's good to have killer food plots on board as you see right there absolutely talking about timing yeah timing's everything uh, but, uh, yeah, it's always, we've been talking with Nick for a couple of years now and, and, you know, and things just stars and moons align for some reason. That's right. And, uh, you know, he's got a great product and uh, we're going to be using it this year. So, uh, you know, stay tuned and we're going to, you know, see how all that works out. And you too might get like a hammer buck. That would be nice. I, I, I haven't seen a, a hammer buck running around. On my property. Speaking of Hammer, Mark Hammer, Mark Hammer was at the show. We did. Antler Action. He's got a new product out this year. He has got a new product out. And for those on the live stream, I can hold it right there. So that is uh, that is what he is touting as the world's smallest deer decoy. Right. And proudly made in the United States, otherwise known as the Tattletail. And we're going to demonstrate this here for you. Try to anyway. For those of you here on the live stream, yeah, you, I don't have it all hooked up here no. per se, but uh, there you go. Is it, okay, it's like this. Yeah, you, you you hang it up on the tree like that, right? Hangs hangs on and side of a tree, a limb or a deer decoy, even on the back end, and it's and there's a string hooked to it. And when you lift it up, for those of you on the string, yep, you can and see there. You can you can use your grunt call, and then you can kind of just give it a little wag of the tail, so to speak, kind of give a little action to the it it mimics the sound. It mimics. A deer tail. You and know? You, you can, uh, the material in here is, uh, you can put scent on there if you want. Yep. You know, you can make a grunt call. Um, uh, whatever call you want to use, you can add scent to that. It gives a little, uh, instead it's a, of it's deer. A, just a little visual flash. Right, a little visual to the to the call. And so. Uh, the biggest thing, you, you don't want to sit there and flap this thing and yank it up and down because then it becomes an alarm flag. Right, exactly. But you it's just want to give like, it a little. In the general direction of where you're calling, and all of a sudden the deer's going to, you know, the buck's hopefully going to, like, hey, what made that noise? Kind of start looking around, and if he sees a little little tail flick in the air, he's like, oh, okay. Hey, that's where that noise is coming from. Yep, and then maybe he smells a little doe estrus on the, and if he's, you put it on there, and he's on his way over. So, but. Uh, but, yeah, it was nice to see him again. Uh, he's got his rattler action going. Um, he's modified it yet again. He's he's brought it down to one pattern, nicely packaged. Uh, talking to him, uh, things are going really good. He was picked up by Kinsey's, and we'll have uh, we have a short video on the on the antler action this year from ATA. And we're going to be releasing yep. it here soon, so stay tuned for that. And, and and for those the weather people, it is 42 degrees now in Luzerne, Michigan. Okay, Luzerne, that's up by me. Yes, it is. Very nice. So, but uh, yeah, it was good to see him again. Just an aisle or two over, we found. Uh, one of our friends that we've now met three years in a row, mm-hmm. Mr. Tom himself from Tom's Custom Turkey Calls. But <laughs> you want to change the name of his company now? Yeah, well, I think he's going to have to because he's actually now going into buck grunts, deer grunts, deer grunts. Right here, he 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 makes the uh, the mouthpiece out of the different types of woods. I think you have a hickory. Yep, mine's hickory. Mine's orange sage. Oh, sage orange. Say that again. Osage Orange. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. So he's expanded. So now he's into to deer grunt tubes. And, of course, now we have got a couple for use for this fall. Absolutely. You know? And uh, we can't wait to try these out. I love how deep this one goes. Mm-hmm. But... Uh, I was trying to change the read in mine. I got to. I got to get. You get gotta, the read out of mine. I got to go. <laughs> you guys dug. But See, uh, you just take that. You go in there. You just kind of change that. There's a little rubber O-ring yep, on there. You can actually O-rings. bring it up and make a uh, a dough bleed out of it. Yep. That's not the dough bleed. No, that's not. <laughs> that's, that's what mine's on right now. Is the. So, but yeah, we. Tom's it. custom turkey calls is now making deer grunts. Right. 
<laughs> and next year he was actually thinking about doing crow calls. Yes. He hit matter of fact, the whole conversation was a guy that makes turkey calls doesn't make a crow call. Yep, somebody asked him about it, yeah. so this is something he's going to be working on hopefully this year. So he will be going back <laughs> after the shows, he said, and, and coming up with a, a crow call and probably have those for next year. There you go. But uh, it's good to see him again. Um, you know, his work is just Phenomenal. incredible. I'm, the, the different pieces of wood that he makes his calls out of, just amazing. The pot calls and the, and the box calls, are really, they're, it's more like artwork than anything. I almost hate to take it in the woods, you know what I'm saying? Uh, really, exactly. So, But, uh, yeah, so it was Speak just... of the devil, I do believe, if I'm not mistaken, let me slide over here. I think... Uh-oh. You got one of them? I think this is his call that I got right here laying up here. If I'm not mistaken. I can tell by the... Yep. Yeah, it is. So, the old pot call, my favorite... Won't be long. We'll be playing with those too. <laughs> nope. So. No, it's about that time. I tell you what, this weather kind of makes you want to get out there and go do some scouting and stuff. Did you yesterday see when you were following me to the show, me pointing out the window feverishly at one point after we left the house? No. You didn't see me flapping my arm like pointing real hard. I think I might have, but I wasn't. Was, there was a field full of turkeys. Is that what it was? Yeah, and there was there was, there was a couple out there, a little bit bigger ones. I mean, they weren't out there strutting and doing their thing, but I'm like. Yeah, I think that's a field full of turkeys. The, I tell you what, after the warm week they're going to have, I'm pretty sure they're going to be going to get rudely with a March storm here. But man, I tell you what, you know, we always see this. We get a quick warm up, then all of a sudden it locks back down. And this is really, really early. I just, what's this going to do to nature? I mean, is it really just going to throw everything to a big tailspin? Nah. Remember the super moon? How it threw in hunting season into a tailspin? And we talked to the gentleman from QDMA. Yeah, and Doctor Kroll. Yeah, they were up at uh, the big club here in Michigan doing their deer necropsy. And, you know, we talked about this. We've talked about this on the show, just you and I, about mm-hmm. the supermoon and hunting. Yeah. And then we talked to Tony Smith of the QDMA mm-hmm. about this and Dr. Kroll. And you've been up at the necropsy up at Turtle Creek? Turtle Lake. Turtle Lake. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, it was proven this year that the supermoon did have an effect. They think it did. I mean, it coincided with the opener of deer season and... The uh, the the breeding what he called it the the mean date the, the average date the mean date that they had actually got pushed back three days right exactly and and they're they're thinking because of the supermoon and I I could totally agree with that mm-hmm. but uh, but my question is how does the supermoon affect breeding cycles right I don't understand the science behind that how the moon would do that I you know I've read a lot on both sides of the, of the fence on this of how the moon may or may not affect uh, the rut or breeding cycles, this, that, and the other. Um, I'm st- I still not sold 100% on, on it one way or the other. So for me, the jury's out. It's one of those things that some people live and die by it. Mm-hmm. Some people care less about it. Yep. That, 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 that goes for, for scents. That goes for, uh, uh, you know. Um, Spit it out. I'm trying to. <laughs> oh, smoking. That's another one. Yeah, you know, yeah. oh, you know, I scent smoke, control. Yeah, yeah scent control, you know how I am about scent control. I know, and then some people they throw all caution us. to the wind, right? Right. So, but yeah, talking to him um, was interesting uh, about the super moon, and it was just you know getting all that fun filled fact information from people. Well, you know, in, in talking with him, we did talk with a guy. Uh, he was one of the local chapter guys working the booth yep but he's also on one of the deer advisory boards and i'm here in the state of michigan i don't remember his exact title and what he did but uh he's part of this group that helps to push regulation one way or the other it doesn't make it but he helps push it one way or the other and make recommendations to dnr and uh it was really interesting listening to him talk about the core principles of qdma and how it works to help with controlling certain diseases even with, with CWD now here in Michigan, uh, excuse me, and with TB. And he talked about those dynamics and how that all worked. And for the life of me, I don't remember everything he said. And we got his card. We want to have him on the show. So Absolutely. We, he, he can was, help explain some of these things. I mean, he was a wealth of knowledge. Mm-hmm. And, but, you know, and, and I think he could explain it in the simplest terms that we can all understand. Right. Without going into the scientific mojo. Right. Getting off way de- deep in the weeds. Right. right. Yeah. Exactly. I, it, it's good to have somebody that's able to do that and explain to everybody 
and get everybody level set mm-hmm. as to why we want to go this way. Yeah, it was... Uh, it, 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 the scientific part of it, it, it looks like it's working. I think so. Um, you know, And that's the thing is, is they've got the, num- the, sci- the, the science behind it, the numbers to back what they're saying. Uh, but he says there's still, he, they still see resistance from people that you know, still believe all it is is trophy hunting and not that the, the, the shooting bigger bucks is a byproduct of a healthy herd. Right, exactly. And you know what? And, and, that, and that's talking to a QDMA gentleman. But then let's take it one step to the to, to the little bit to the left when you talk to Nick Percy mm-hmm. and you talk about his his uh, the new the pellets he has for to feed the deer. That, those the are nutrition pellets. The, those are developed to help the nu- nutrition of the deer. It's right. not to grow big antlers. Right. He's putting this nutrition out there for the deer so the the does can produce three pounds of more milk. You know, and it, it, it's just to help their bodies and mm-hmm. the, the rumen inside the stomachs. And, you know, we talked for him a little bit, and you, you heard on the interview. But, uh, yeah, it, it's it's not about shooting big bucks. No, it's about a healthy herd, maintaining a healthy herd, Main, helping helping to help <coughs> nature control these things without it being so violent. Right. Some of the things that we see in nature that uh, when, when it does get skewed, and it gets ugly quick. It does. You know, where, where disease does crop in, you know. And he told us the story up at up at Turtle Lake, you know, when the first time he, uh, Dr. Kroll went in there and, and gave them his recommendations as to how many does they want to shoot to, to what they're actually shooting now mm-hmm. and how the mindset changed. Yeah, and it, it's taken years. Yep. It, and it does. It takes time. Um, part of that problem is, I want I hate to say it, but it's old school, new school. Old school mentality versus new school mentality. You know, and, and at my age, I'm... You know, I'm probably more of that old school mindset. I'm at the tail end of it, but you know, I, it's taken me a while to open my mind right to, exactly. to to listening and understanding and and really digging into the science and understanding what it does and how these dynamics change the health of the herd. So, and but they have been they have seen an increase in the APR section of Michigan up in that uh, northwest northwest uh, the me, the mean age of the deer being taken are getting older exactly so then they're taking more dose mm-hmm. so it's all working it's working so i'll tell you what though we're, we're bumping up uh here on our last break uh, why don't we step outside we come back we'll kind of wrap up things here talking about the show and a couple of the little odd ends and things that are going on so we're going to step outside we'll be right back after this i shoot pse because i like one pin to 40 yards I shoot PSE for the perfect combination of feel and performance. I shoot PSE because you can shoot lighter poundage and increase arrow speed. I shoot PSE for the fastest bows on the planet. I shoot PSE because my livelihood depends on my bow. I shoot PSE because better engineering makes a better bow. I shoot PSE. I shoot PSE. I shoot PSE. I shoot PSE. Experience PSE. Experience performance. Throughout human history, one notorious killer has remained at the top and claimed more lives than any war or natural disaster combined. Mosquitoes. It's time to arm yourself and protect your family this season with Scentblocker's new Bug Blocker for insects. Lasting up to eight hours, Bug Blocker not only repels biting mosquitoes that can carry the West Nile virus, but other biting insects, including chiggers, biting flies, gnats, and ticks which can carry Lyme disease. Field tested by outfitters and guides from Alaska to Alabama and everywhere in between. The results are in, and Bug Blocker flat out works. In a high-potency sportsman strength dosage, using 25% no-nonsense DEET, plus two specific ingredients to target biting flies, Bug Blocker plays for keeps. For ultimate protection, pair Bug Blocker insects with Bug Blocker ticks. Welcome back, everybody. Last segment of the show. We've been talking a little bit of, I don't know, kind of about everything. Well, it's kind of... Uh, it's one of them weekends. I survived the week. That was the number one key thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, it was just a weekend of uh, being in an outdoor show. And uh, I still can't get over, I hate to say it, but 
I don't know what PSC is going to do anymore at a 90% let off. <laughs> yeah, it just, uh, the technology just keeps jumping every single year. It seems like something new comes out. So. All right. So let's see. Got a question? Sounds, sounds good. Okay. Here is loud and clear. Good deal. Oh, uh, and Tom Covert. Yes, you missed the first segment. So now you're in the last segment. <laughs> Sorry, Tom. You, we're, we're, Snooze you lose. For those on the podcast, we're actually we're taking a few questions and comments here off the live stream. Right, exactly. But so. um, 90% let off with the Evolve and the new cam system uh, on the Carbon Air. Uh, that bow, and I had several people shoot it, and they were just, it was, again, the wow factor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know. I think just getting people shooting that thing is the th is the key to to know you can look at it see it but once you touch it feel it and shoot it then you understand it then you understand it absolutely but uh no it was a good weekend um i was surprised at the lack of deer that were entered in the back of the show yeah yeah speaking of deer um yeah there wasn't a lot of a lot of deer entered uh for scoring and for the drawing and all that and i don't really understand how all that works but uh Two of our Mossy Oak Pro staffers that we're, uh, we staff with actually had deer that entered, and they they won something. I don't understand how that right. all worked and didn't yeah. hear what they won, but they did win something, uh, the deer that they did enter. Um, but on the way home, since how we're talking about the, a little bit about the outdoors, a little bit about the show, on the way home from the show, I'm coming back and about halfway back, and I, I already explained to you kind of where I was at. Uh, driving along a freeway, and I kind of look over. I look over to my right because this field always has deer in it, usually, especially in, in the fall. But uh, lo and behold, there's deer out there in the field. You know, it's four, five, six does. And then as I look, coming up to them is a buck. Yes, I said a buck. I, it was a buck. I could see antlers on it. It was a, a mainframe six at the edge of his ears, you know, pretty tall. Uh, it wasn't an overly big deer. It didn't have a lot of mass to him, but, you know, it was a good, healthy deer. But you could, you could tell it was a buck. He still had antlers on. I believe it. The 19th of February, and he's still carrying you his will head see, gear. I've seen deer in my backyard mm -hmm. into March. I've seen them south like that, but not this far north. Yep. I will see it. It's been a few years, but there's usually, I can catch a, sometimes I'll catch a buck in March that'll mm -hmm. still have his antlers. Yeah. It's just, it, to me, it's getting a little late in the game. I and think. I think what happens is eventually, uh, Mother Nature just says, uh, excuse me, but those got to go. <laughs> they got to go. Because <laughs> we're going to start growing new ones, and I think they get pushed out eventually. But, uh, yeah, it, it's... Um, it just shocked me. It is. It, well, it's here it is. You, you've heard people in end of December in December saying, oh, mm -hmm. deer are losing the racks, and all of a sudden you see one here in February. Yeah. End of February, and one has one. Right. So... Yeah, it's a little different. Yeah, it just... Uh, but that's Mother Nature. Got another question posted there. Oh... Let's see. Predator hunt here next weekend. Coyote, fox, and bobcat makes the trifecta. Oh, so J Jason's going to be doing a little uh, predator hunting next week. You know what? It's a great time of year to do that. I've got actually, I got two quick story. Well, I got one quick story about that, and I got one story that we can probably finish out the show with. Quick story is on the way to the show this morning. <laughs> talking about the show again, but as I'm driving down the freeway and I look to my north. You know, on the side of the freeway, I just something caught my eye. And I, as I glance over, on the other side of the fence that's in the ditch, right? you know, the boundary line from the freeway, um, there was like a, a really nasty, tangled edge, you know, really uh, just scrub weeds and tangled, just brush. And walking along the edge of that brush was a coyote. And he was hunting. He was looking. He was looking in the brush. He wasn't paying attention to the road. And I, like I did a double take, you know, and turned real quick. I'm like, ah, oh, Mr. Coyote, look, look, you know, look, looking for uh, looking for breakfast, looking for breakfast. Yeah. And um, Tom Covert, uh, what do you fellows know about piebald deer? Saw my first one uh, about a week ago. No rack. Well, you know what? It could uh, piebald deer could either be bucks or does. We got a doe. We got a piebald doe actually that runs our property. You do, and it's called socks. Socks. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a it's a doe that we've been watching for two years now. Saw her as a fawn, and she's, uh, you know, this year she's a year and a half old doe. And we pretty much put a collar on her, uh, an imaginary collar. It's like, hands off, don't shoot. Right, yeah. Uh, and we're letting her go because we want to see if she throws piebald uh, fawns this coming year when she gets bred. Uh, this one, the one I'm talking about, she's she's got white legs 
up to her elbows. Okay, front and rear. Looks like she's got white sanitary socks on. Yep, and that's why we call her socks. And then on each side of her body, not just her belly hair white, but up on her side, predominantly up on her side are two big circles on each side. So, um, and I, and here behind my house, I've seen a, a buck, oh, seven, eight years ago. And we call him Dirty White Boy because he was all white, but he looked like he rolled in the mud. You oh, know, okay. it, it was a dirty white looking right. color. Yeah, he wasn't a, a pure. Yeah. And he was an eight point, nice eight point. You know, we've seen him around for, for one full year. Don't know if he ever was shot or nobody ever said that they did here in the area, but uh, we did see him a lot. And I seen another one here in the area. It was a doe. She was completely white except from her neck up. She was, you know, it was like they took a head off of a regular doe and stuck it on this white doe. Oh, okay. You know, but her neck and her head was, you know, was brown. So uh, Jason also says, uh, and this is kind of funny. Uh, the DNR says there's a, a bear boon boom going on up here. And you know what? We talked to the DNR. Matter of fact, talked to him today. Uh, talked to him today about that. Uh, they're uh, in. It's posted on the Michigan DNR website. You can go check out the recommendations that they have put in for the bear season com- upcoming. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what they've put in for uh, a couple of Baldwin. Baldwin and Red Oak. And Red Oak. They're they've, increasing tags. They've increased the tags because of that. The Matter of fact, you're spot on, uh, Jason, that uh, that's what they've asked for as an increase because of the uh, they checked into the incidents. Yeah. Well, and actually I heard that there was a 19% increase in uh, the, the bear population, at least in the Red Oak District, which is where I hunt. And they they said that there are more bear there now. For that reason alone, they're they're bringing more tags to that that hunt. So um, I can't remember exactly what they had before. I think it was six hundred, and now they're going to seven hundred. So I think it's a, don't quote me on that, but I think it's a right. hundred tag increase. And all this is public information. Uh, yep. We it was kind of fun. She brought it up on her phone, and we went through the recommendations that they recommended. Uh, and they'll be online for a month. Then they go to rec- recommendations, and then they're going to say, "This is what we want." Yep, they'll make their proposals. They, they and might set, make set a couple the tweaks reds. at the in in a month, but uh, yeah, it was a good question because that was we talked about that today. Uh, hey, Charles, how you doing out there? Glad we're sounding good. Um, so Jason uh, says it's a twenty nine percent increase since twenty twelve. I believe that we're seeing that around our area as well. Yeah, Mike's seeing that uh, up at his hunt club too. That they're seeing well, even around the surrounding there. area, just that whole general area up there is, uh, we're hearing more and seeing, you know, seeing, seeing more. I mean, I'm picking them up on trail cam, right? Um, a lot more frequently than than years past. Uh, the one thing that that does concern me about the bear population up there, um, and I don't know if a lot of people know this, but bear are natural predators to doe or deer fawn. They are one of the tops. They uh, they found act- that out in the uh, Mississippi. Uh- the, the study in the, the UP. study in the UP. They we've seen it hand, firsthand at our camp. Uh, they will. We've got a field in front of uh, of our camp, and we let it grow tall. That rye, we let that right. rye or weed, whatever we got planted, we let it grow really tall. We don't mow it until late July, so the does can actually fawn in it. And we've seen bear repeatedly come through and start searching and running that that high grass to try to find them. Yep. So uh, yeah, so. they're a, they're a very good predator of fawns. And uh, we actually caught them on trail cam as well. So, and Tom wants to know uh, how common are piebalds? Percentage wise, I don't know. That's, that's a I good question. It's, it's not a. It's not a big. It's not a big factor. It's a small factor that they even ha- exist. Yeah. Uh, but it, it depends on what. To be a one hundred percent albino, albino is way more than being a piebald, mm-hmm. and then it's even less. You know, but uh, it. You'll run. You, what you'll happen is you'll get into a genetic traits within the family in that area. Yeah, you'll see it in a few deer in that area, and that's why we're, we're we let uh, you know we're, we let socks go. We didn't, nobody's going to shoot her at least not in our camp, and we're going to see if she does happen to throw fawns this year that are piebald. You know, it's just it's kind of our own little experiment to see you know what happens. Right. You know, we haven't seen a buck that's that's piebald, um, but there is another doe. It's about it, we think is the same age that runs in the same family group, and she has very similar characteristics on on her legs. Okay, not on her sides, but on her legs. She's they're not as high. The right. socks aren't as high on her up to her elbow like on socks. But uh, so I think they're sisters. Right. You know, Just don't a know little, that a little bit difference. Yeah, they won't be the same. Yep. So okay, Jason, tell us how many deer you've seen this year. It's 
so we'll see what he says. <laughs> it's kind of fun taking questions here live over. over You're the welcome, Tom. Anytime. So you know, and when you see him, uh, try to get a picture of him. It's fun to to get a picture of him and keep him around and see if you can find him the next year yeah. or like like Mike here. Uh, thinks he's got sisters running along in the same area. Well, la- last week I was at camp, and I went up for the logging project and uh, actually saw socks. I got video of her. I've, I've yet to post it online, but I actually got socks. Oh, okay. Last good. weekend she, she came right across the field in front of us. She kind of stopped and looked at us like, oh, okay, and then boom, she took off. How old do you think she is? She's a year and a half old, though. Oh, you're yeah, yeah, oh, okay. I, yeah. I got I got video and photos of her as a fawn, uh, not this summer, but summer previous. So she's a year and a half old. That we do know. So we're, it's kind of cool being able to distinguish one deer and kind of you know start to follow that deer and see what happened. You know the different dynamics right. of what they go through and what happens and what they do. So very interesting. But, and, uh, and Jason saw one deer during deer season. That's not good. No. Um, you know, and talking about being last week at camp, we'll kind of wrap up the show with this. I got a quick story talking about predator hunting. Uh, I got up to camp Friday night. I woke up Saturday morning, seven thirty, and I had the heater running in my room. And then I went back to sleep. Woke up at eight thirty, and then finally got out of bed at nine thirty, and went over to our camp manager's house next door. And he said, "Did you hear the? Did you hear the coyote?" And I'm like, "No, I didn't hear no coyote." What time? He said eight o'clock. He goes ran across the lake. He says, actually, it's his probably right outside your window. And I'm like, yeah, 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 whatever. So we get out, we and then there's snow on the ground. Not a lot, but there's snow on the ground. And we walked over fresh tracks right outside my window. It was a coyote. But the problem is he's there's a feral cat in the area that he's been letting cruise around because it's keeping the chipmunks and the red squirrel and the mice away from our, our uh, hunting camp yep. or our, our lodge because we've had issues with that. So you know, it's, he's kind of patrolling the area. Well, this coyote and the cat tussled right outside my bedroom window. And we, we looked at the tracks, tried to figure all this this whole situation out and see really what went down. You can see where the two tussled. And there's fur on the ground. It wasn't cat fur, though. It was coyote fur. I mean, it was very noticeable. It was there, There's a big difference between them. And uh, I've seen enough coyote fur. I said, that's coyote fur. You know, the cat's white. The fur's brown. Right. So that right there alone. But there's no blood. So we're like, okay, did he kill the cat? Just break its neck and take it off and go eat it somewhere? Is that when, when he's seen it running across the lake, the frozen lake? So we started following the tracks, and it started to go up the road, up the two-track, away from our camp, up to this ridge. And all of a sudden, it stopped and turned to come back, and we look, and here come a pair, a two pair, or a pair of coyotes, two coyotes coming down the hill. So we figure, he's going up the hill, these two are coming down, and he sees it, and he turns tuck tail and run, and that's when he ran off and went across the lake. Right, exactly. So and you know what? It's it's funny. I seen the video because you did this all on video. I yeah, I've video. got video of this. I'm gonna try to put a little you clip know, together. It, it's but then the interesting thing was, and we don't know if did he hear the coyote going after the cat, or did he hear what we found later? We went down, and followed these tracks. They go onto the ice. We see a distinct set of tracks going across the ice. Then two, the the set of two come down to the ice in a different spot, and all of a sudden there's this huge spot where it looked like they tussled. WWF went on. Yep, exactly. There's no hole in the ice. There's no nothing. Okay, and there's fur everywhere. Yep, coyote fur. And he's like, man, they were fighting here. You know, when we kind of thought about it, walked around, checked a couple things. And I'm like, what time of year is it? It's, it's middle of February. I don't think I don't think they were fighting. The, the other F word, as he like to say it. That's what he said. He said, maybe, I said, exactly. It's mating season. Yep, exactly. So, and uh, it was pretty cool to be able to see where that happened at. Think, do we know that's what happened? No, but that's, we, it was a pretty strong indication that's what it was. Right. And then it was last weekend. Yep. Did you find out if the cat, he thinks he saw fresh cat tracks. Okay. Yeah. He might have, it's, Cat might have got scared the heebie-jeebies out of it. Though. Right. Like, well, the thing is, is he's been put. He he puts the little cat food out just to kind of keep him around the area. Even though this this thing's a mouser anyway, and he he's cleaning the woods up, you know. Right. But uh, the recent problem is is now he's got raccoons getting into the cat food. So oh, absolutely, they'll be so little... that's making a huge mess. So now he's having to get rid of that and just he thinks he thinks he's still there, but he hasn't seen him. Okay. So good. he saw cat tracks. That's good. Yeah. But uh, yeah, no. Uh, 
That's a cool story. And then I'm with the video and you got shows. It happened right under your window. Right dude. outside my window. How could you how could you not hear that? I'm talking ten literally ten, fifteen feet outside my window. I know. It at the most. Exactly. And you yeah. slept right through it. Well, I had the heater going on. Right. That's right. And those heaters are pretty loud in there. So, so you know. You know. And I, I was I was contemplating taking my rifle up and getting up that morning to the coyote hunt. Had had I done what I wanted to do. I may, I don't know. I may or may not see him. I might have spooked him off. I may have, you know, went a different you had, direction. You actually might have went too far away. Yeah. So, you so I'm thinking where you probably would have went. You probably you probably would have came back and saw these tracks and said, yeah. well, "Why did I go anywhere?" Well, see, when I come into camp, I park on the far side of camp. You know, in the, in the drive. Yes. I don't park on that side for that reason alone. When I'm up there by myself, I keep things really quiet. When you when you keep the woods quiet, you don't go slamming doors, you don't honk horns, you don't go making noise. If you keep it quiet, like nothing's there, animals aren't alarmed. They don't, you know, they act natural. They're not right. spooked off. And truthfully, really, you can do that really easy at your place because if yeah. you stay on the one side, you'll never it's secluded. Even, you never even have to go to the lakeside. Exactly. They didn't know I was there. Right. So, but uh, you know, that's uh, a. It's an awesome story. It was, it was pretty cool, and I got video. Like I said, I got I got to throw it on a computer and and uh, kind of put it together because I shot five or six, maybe seven different video clips of yep. what actually happened as we told the story and f- tried to figure this whole as you guys seen CSI'd out. CSI'd it. Yeah, we did. We kind of did it like a wood CSI. You, you know? were. It was uh, like the the murder scene. You know, there was no, there was no cat. T- you know, outline tape down or nothing like that, but uh, no blood spatter. No, there wasn't. That, so, was, kind of, that was kind of thing I was, I was watching the video. It was like, yeah. But if they would have broke its neck, it would have. But yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. I think I think he got scared off by the other two. That's kind of what I'm I'm thinking. You know, I, I think don't the know. cat made it safe somewhere, and then all of a sudden he heard those other two, and they're like, "What?" Yeah, he's like, "Well, uh, it's time to leave." <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, nope, uh, you're right, uh, Jason. Uh, the rabbits should be easy to see if the snow disappears. Yes, they will be. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, but uh, no, another interesting week here in Michigan. Yeah, interesting weather. Interesting critters are out. I've seen ducks and geese today. Man, um, it was like a there, there's slaughter fest on the roads. Oh yeah, coons and possums everywhere. I mean, you, you can tell with this warm weather, things are waking up and they're getting out, getting active. Yeah, and no. getting squished. Yeah, it was. Uh, <laughs> This morning there was a couple of few fresh ones. It was like, yeah. whoa, that was bright red. No kidding. So, but I was surprised. I didn't see more. I didn't see any deer actually. I didn't either. I didn't. You come to think, but I didn't see any deer hit on the road. All those fields. Yeah. Not. Oh, you didn't side, see. You didn't see any deer in the fields. In the fields, or or on the side of the road, for that matter. Yeah, I seen deer twice. I seen deer yesterday, and I seen deer today. Okay, so not a lot, but but I did see a few. So they're they're around. They're getting out, and getting moseying around. I haven't seen my deer behind the house. Um, every morning I get up and look out. I, did, I haven't seen them in two or three days, and I really thought I'd see them out moving with this warm weather. Ah, uh, they're they might be moving different times now. Could be, could be. Mm-hmm. So. so, but that's that's kind of all that's going on. Um, yeah, no, it was a, a an action packed weekend, kind of. I'd like to get up north next weekend, maybe. Um, I know you and I've got got plans yep. uh, on Friday, um, but. I'm, I'm thinking maybe Saturday. I don't know. I, I need to run up. I, I got to get uh, soil sample results. Yeah, you got to get the results for uh, Nick. For, for Nick so we can start putting a plan together. Um, I've got a, a guy that I'm working with uh, at our camp that's going to, we're going to work together on, on getting the fields, fields in, uh, getting all that, that taken care of. He's excited about working with me, so. Hopefully that's all, all going to come to fruition as well. So and a lot of good stuff. Good. We get those, uh, we're going to have to get some... Uh, Cages made for you. Yep, some growth cages. Yeah, so we, we can monitor that as well. But uh, I'm looking forward to working with him. I think it's going to be a good year. I really do. Yeah, I'm looking forward to getting things rolling. So absolutely. But uh, you know, I tell you what, uh, for uh, for us here on the podcast, I think we wrap up the show, and uh, you know, next week we'll come back. Hopefully, we have some more good stuff to talk about. Yeah, you know, and uh, tune in next week. Uh, same same time. Hopefully, a little less difficulties. <laughs> hopefully, we'll I think have we these just might have figured something out here. Well, I hope so. We'll see. For now. We'll see. But, uh, you know, that'll do it for us this week. So make sure to tune in and uh, follow us through the week and see what's going on. But we'll be back again next week. This episode was brought to you by PSC Archery, Black Eagle Arrows, Scent Blocker, Killer Food Plots, Cabela's, Spot Shooters, Antler Action, Family Traditions Tree Stands, Tom's Custom Turkey Calls, and Badass Slingshots. Shots.
Thanks for listening, and join us again here next week. Until then, remember, as we always like to say, if you're out on the water or in the woods, shoot straight and be safe until next week on the Up North Journal.